Hello, my name is Christina Davis. I'm the director of the program on US-Japan relations. And welcome, good evening if you're here in Boston. Good morning if you're joining us from East Asia. We're really happy to bring you all together by Zoom to talk about how East Asia responds to US election results. You know, this has been a week where we can celebrate progress of science. There's the exciting news of a potential COVID vaccine. We've all watched with joy the successful SpaceX crew, Dragon Resilience, launching this week, including a Japanese astronaut, Soichi Noguchi, successfully docking at the International Space Station. All of this celebrates science and achievement. But when it comes to elections, the United States has not held up an example of either advanced technology or social unity. This presidential election has been frustrating for citizens. And I can imagine it has been even more confusing for those watching overseas. And yet the central role of the United States in East Asia has meant the results of the American election are important in East Asia. And so many have been watching our election. And so today we have a chance to think carefully and hear from experts about how East Asia responds to the United States election. And we're really fortunate to have this event. First, thank you to our executive director, Shinji Fujihira, bringing together experts from three different countries and Harvard across time zones is even more complicated than our normal events. We are also fortunate to have a co-sponsorship from the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, the Korea Institute, the Harvard University Asia Center, and the Wilson Center Asia Program. Most of all, I am very excited to bring to you a very expert panel of scholars to discuss this important issue today. We have with us Professor Toshihiro Nakayama, who is a leading scholar of American politics. He is Professor of American Politics and Foreign Policy at the Faculty of Policy Management, Keio University. He has published several books on American politics including American Ideology, Hoshu Shugi Undo to Seiji Bunda, American Ideology. He's also written on American foreign policy and rethinking conservatism in the United States. We're very fortunate to have him joining us here. And he will be followed by Professor Xinhua Li. Professor Li is a scholar of political science who is professor for the Department of Political Science and International Relations of Korea University. She has also been a member of the Trilateral Commission and we are very proud that she spent a year with us at Harvard as a postdoctoral fellow of the CFIA from 1994. She has published widely, including a book that came out last year on human security and cross-border cooperation in East Asia. Her expertise is both politics and international relations. Indeed, she is a member of the Trilateral Commission and has served with the United Nations Secretary General Advisory Group on peace building. Finally, we also have with us Professor Wu Xinbo, who is a leading expert of Chinese foreign policy and China-US relations. He is the professor and dean of the Institute of International Studies Pudan University, also a member of the Trilateral Commission, the World Economics Forum, Global Agenda Council on Geoeconomics, and an author of many prominent publications, including work on China, Asia Pacific chess game, and Asia Pacific regional order. And of course, looking at the question of the China challenge, competitor or order transformer. We are very fortunate to have these three scholars joining us today from China, Korea, and Japan, and to have our own Harvard University professor, Ezra Vogel, joining us as a discussant. Professor Vogel, of course, is the founding director of the program on US-Japan relations, and has also served as director of the Fairbanks Center, and he has published so many books, from Japan is number one to Deng Xiaoping, Transformation of China, and his latest book, China and Japan Facing History, 
which I can say, having just used it in my own course teaching at Harvard, is an excellent book I recommend if you have not yet had the chance to read it yet. So we have much to learn today, and I now welcome our panelists to begin. They will each give a short presentation, followed by Professor Vogel's discussant remarks, and we'll have a brief period for question and answer at the end. Thank you so much for joining us. Here is the Zoom etiquette, where we would ask you to keep your microphone muted. And if you can ask your question in the chat or raise your blue hand as a participant, we will try to call on you if there is time permitting at the end. Thank you so much. Professor Nakayama, would you like to start us off? Hey, well, well thank you, uh, Professor Davis. Uh, and thanks for having me here. And I'm going to jump in, uh, jump right into my remarks. And uh, I guess uh, for many Japanese, American presidential election is sort of, you know, including its chaotic nature, I think it's a celebration of, uh, you know, democracy. And looking back in what happened in 2008, many sort of younger generation was inspired what went on in 2008. And many sort of generation above me could still spark a phrase from uh, uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy's uh, inauguration speech. And for my son, who was like 12 years old, he's the I mean, President Obama is the first president that sort of he recognized. So for him, an African American president, American president is like totally natural. But, you know, of course, he's been confused uh, uh, since you've uh, elected the current president. And uh, I think maybe for the first time, uh, uh, there was a sense of uh, looking at the what's going on in the US uh, uh, throughout the presidential election this year. I think there was a sense of amazement, uh, but a worry and even a pity, I think. And many uh, uh, of us here are worried about the, the state of American democracy. And especially looking you know, back uh, through the process, like the, the first presidential debate, uh, debate was really worrying because it's not just the chaotic nature, but the, it's the visceral and the mean tone that we were extremely worried about. I think the interest in Japan uh, towards uh, this election was huge and it's fascinating that not a few people know what a 12th amendment is, right? And that US has been carrying the torch of democracy at least since the beginning of uh, the, the last century. Uh, but there is a, a concern about, like I said, about the state of American democracy. In 2016, like we were, everybody was wrong, right? Mostly. But looking back, it's, I think it's, it's possible to explain what happened, like the F FBI investigation, the fact that Hillary was the second unliked candidate and all those things, you know, we, we did not know, or you did not know how Mr. Trump would act as a president. But 2020 is, is like totally different because you've experienced four years of Mr. Trump or the Trump era. There's this corona sort of virus going on, the, uh, the, the racial strife and the, the deep division. So if you had elected uh, uh, Mr. Trump in, in 2020, I think uh, the American people uh, themselves have to sort of change your own, own perception about yourselves and definitely how the world will look at the US would be, would be totally different. So these concerns were, were quite huge in Japan, but what was different in Japan from other a Western democracy was that Japan, I wouldn't say it was comfortable, but was okay with Mr. Trump. And I guess there was three factors. Uh, one is of course, you know, Prime Minister Abe's per, sort of personal chemistry with Mr. Trump. I think it was uh, based on a strategic decision rather than a genuine, uh, you know, personal chemistry, but it, it worked out and it, it absorbed the Trump shock. So I think that was huge. And second, uh, the China factor is, is very important because if we compared uh, with the previous administration, the Obama administration, the first, uh, you know, Obama, chi first term Obama China policy sort of stuck with us. It, it had the tone of G2 and that you know, US and China getting together, solving all the important issues that the, that, that the world is facing. That was not a comfortable position for us. So although we know that like in the mid 2010s, the US perception about China has changed. We were worried about sort of Democrats returning and 
felt not totally, but secure under Mr. Trump's policy. So that's the second part. The third part is that in Japan, there is a lack of like a populist national sort of movement a robust populist national. Of course, we're a democracy, we have fringe movements, but like if you compare it with Germany, France and UK, where you have uh, Brexit, a uh, People's Front and AFD, we don't have that. So uh, Ch uh, Angela Merkel, uh, uh, Macron and, and Theresa May before Boris Johnson, they were worried about those movements sort of, you know, uh, having sort of, uh, sort of a synchronization with the Trump phenomenon. And we didn't have that. So we, it was difficult for the Japanese people to understand sort of the danger of the Trump phenomenon. So I think these were uh, the reasons why Japanese were relatively comfortable with Mr. Trump. And, uh, 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 and during this election season, precisely because of this, pre precisely because Japan, Japanese people as a whole was relatively comfortable with Mr. Trump, I think for the first time I've been, uh, uh, on media and uh, you know, publicly talking about the US election since 2000. And I've always tried to maintain as a sort of a neutral analyst. But for the first time, uh, uh, I sort of took a position on which you know, candidate is better for Japan, for the world and for the US. You know, if, if I made an argument uh, like B Biden or Trump, many people would not be convinced because precisely because of the reason that I've mentioned. But the sort of the, uh, the argument that I made was that imagine an America you can foresee as an extension of Trump's election and compare that with an America you can foresee as an extension of Biden's election. And if you know America is to revive sort of the, the vital center right, that uh, Arthur Schlesinger sort of elaborated which was the foundation of a post-war internationalism, I thought uh, Biden was the only chance. Because if, you, if America had elected Mr. Trump, the, the Republican party would become a totally Trumpified party and, uh, and sort of the left wing within the Democratic party would not be sort of uh, convinced by the moderate line and sort of you know, take the progressive, the, the, uh, the progressive line. And there would be a huge split, I think. But if Biden, he had one. If, if if Biden wins, there would be hopefully a re redefinition within the Republican Party, and the progressive within the Democratic Party will try to cooperate with the moderate wing. And this is hopefully as well. So it's not that Mr. Biden could sort of revive the the vital center, but I I, I saw him as the only chance. Right? So. How the election turned out, I'm happy with it. Uh, 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 I'm happy that uh, Mr. Biden won, but it, the, the sort of the result weren't as clear was uh, you know how we expected because we knew looking from the polls and all that you know it wasn't going to be an overwhelming win by Mr. Biden, but there was sort of an expectation that America American people would reject Mr. Trump. But I don't really think that happened. It wasn't a full repudiation. So uh, uh, the results of the election is that I think uh, Mr. Trump increased uh, the number of votes he had received in 2016. And he sort of uh, surpassed the, uh, the number Mr. Obama got, President Obama got in 2008. So it kind of signals that what happened in 2016 is not an anomaly. And it's, it's, it wasn't just Hillary's fault, right? So in that sense, I was as shocked in 2016, uh, how much support uh, that Mr. Trump got. But at the same time, uh, you know, you have to be careful that you, you, you shouldn't be over, over learning from the mistakes we made in 2016. Because uh, in fact, Mr. Biden got the sort of the largest number, despite the fact that Democrats lost uh, their seats in the House and uh, didn't do quite well in the Senate. And uh, even though there was a huge enthusiasm gap between the Trump side and the Biden side, uh, Mr. Biden by, won by uh, uh, five million votes. So what was difficult for us to understand the message of this election was that, and this sounds sort of uh, like a contradiction, but Americans enthusiastically 
chose to return to normalcy. So that was, I guess, the confusing part. And we tend to sort of overestimate the strength of the Trump phenomenon. And I, I, I do see them as being a significant force, but uh, the, uh, the results of the election, I think is a bit more clearer, uh, clear than it, it seems on the surface. Uh, Mr. Biden uh, is known to be, I guess, uh, as an internationalist, you know, uh, 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 as a chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as a vice president. But I've talked to many people here in Japan, politicians, bureaucrats, leaders, and not many people know about Biden, uh, at least in Japan. I don't know about uh, uh, China and Korea. In China, I guess uh, uh, President Xi uh, knows uh, Biden personally, but here in Japan, he's not that well known. So our worry is that he, he, he is an internationalist, but he's a sort of an Atlanticist, the, the sort of the traditional school of American foreign policy. So we, we are relieved, but there are worries. And, and the biggest worry, again, is uh, the Biden teams, uh, how they would formulate a China policy. I've been telling the people that perception about China has changed in the US in the mid uh, uh, 2010s. So whether it be a Democrat or a Republican, the basically sort of a tough stance would continue. Uh, but that is not fully convinced. But if you if you sort of consider you know sort of a, a competition with China as being systemic, and it would continue on beyond the Trump era, of course, into the 2030s, 40s, and 50s, sort of punch you in the face toughness towards China. I don't think it's sustainable. So I think you U.S. has to reassemble the vital center that, that you, you've, you've had back in the Cold War days. And unless you don't do that, this long sort of competition could be turned out into something more harsher. Uh, a, a long sort of competition would, uh, with China uh, it would not be sustainable. So therefore, I think Biden's victory is, is good for uh, Japan and uh, good for the world and, and good for the US. So the task facing uh, Biden is immense. And the, I guess the biggest worry that we have is that if he fails, uh, you know, Trump 2024 is not a joke, I think, because he, if the Republicans hold a primary to today, Mr. Trump would achieve a, I think, an overwhelming win. And if uh, Mr. Biden is not able to succeed, I don't think uh, uh, you cannot uh, expect a robust redefinition within uh, the Democrat, uh, I mean, the Republican Party. So I hope he, he succeeds. But, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Trump 2024 sounded almost like a joke, but I guess now it's not necessarily a joke. So with that sort of a gray or dark note, I will end here. Thank you. You've been sounding so optimistic. Thank you very much for your remarks, both the positive and the warnings. Next, we have Professor Lee. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good morning and good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here in Shinji Fujihira and Ezra Bogeo and Ed Baker. And I see some good, good faces. Thank you. Well, let me start with uh, my observation on the election which will be followed by some kind of implication on Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula. Um, there is the anxiety that the next 65 days will be the most dangerous because of Trump's disobedience and probably precarious actions. And there are the widespread COVID-19 crisis in the US and serious economic and social implication. And there are growing concern, if not criticism, that American democracy or democratic system is a crisis. Probably because of that, the president-elect Biden's priority will be mostly domestic rather than the foreign policy. However, Biden's election, just like what Toshihiro has mentioned, 
has brought international expectation because or for the so-called normalization of U.S. diplomacy that will give immense impact on the world, including Korea and Northeast Asia. Because we believe the power of diplomacy should be here, not diplomacy of power. Well, although I said that, I think we have to think about what is the Biden's uh, foreign policy. As we are now given a major problem under President Trump was that he uh, abandoned the nation's responsibility for global leadership and provision of global public goods. So the new Biden administration had no choice but to provide a stable form of global leadership, preferably through multilateral cooperation of states who share values and ideology and mm, through international organization in creating the United Nations. Solidarity with European country in international affairs is expected to be greatly strengthened. And Biden is of Irish descent and has been involved in the Northern Ireland Agreement, I think in uh, 1988 or so. And it's quite friendly to regional cooperation and solidarity based on the European Union. In particular, he will be very active, citing the ideology and values shared in improving relations with NATO allies that were damaged during the Trump time. Under Biden foreign policy that value alliance and multilateral networks, there is a high possibility of, however, grouping into US-led value-oriented multilateral network and countries that do not. Maybe we can call them a liberal democracy. Biden's US must lead again slogan is a global responsibility that we all welcome. But by emphasizing the US-led multilateral alliance, it could strengthen the solidarity of anti-US coalition. So the multilateral network advocated by Biden is an anti-China consultative body that can change the name of existing multilateral security network such as in the Pacific strategies or Quad or Quad Plus. But that is the value of democracy and human rights will continue to be checked by the US against or vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia that have different or opposing ideologies. So here, let me just move on to Northeast Asia. The first, the China. I won't be surprised if Biden may uh, try to pursue ABT, anything but Trump. But when it comes to China policy, given Biden's political experience and given all the mess what Trump has done, he will make or try the ABT policy. But when it comes to Chinese issue, I don't think we see much difference. That's what we can call containment leaning policy. Even considering the importance of public opinion in American politics and di diplomacy, and since particularly COVID-19, those growing uh, distrust between the two superpowers, more than 72% of Americans have been unfriendly to China, according to the poll that the Pew Research about three months ago. So he's expected to stick to his hardline policy, even in recognition of public criticism and uh, that uh, Biden has Biden has been known as a pro-China in a way. So I think Biden would like to get rid of that image because in US politics, the public opinion, American people's opinion is the, the more the import, the important than anything else. The Trump administration proceeded with pressure on China based on America's national interest. On the other hand, the Biden administration is expected to apply the principle of international norms and global standard when pressing China. But we have to remember that when Trump presses China based solely on US interest, that the international community's criticism, criticism goes to the United States to some extent. But there are some possibility of negotiations between the US and China. But if Biden put forward international norms in front, 
it will put more pressure on China and China doesn't seem to have much room uh, to defy about it. When it comes to Sino-American conflict has significant implication on the Korean Peninsula and as a result, understanding the Biden administration's approach remains very crucial to South Korea. Obama led the, as we all know, rebalancing of Asia and Trump presented his Indo-Pacific plan. While the ideological basis of the policy has been different, the core or gist has not changed and retains consistency across different administrations. Presumably, Biden will aim for the stabilization of the Asian region as well as the strengthening of alliances. Asia will no longer be divided into four sectors, what we call East, Central, Southwest, and Middle East. And the quadrilateral security dialogue, Quad, will continue to become an important strategic asset to Biden. Biden even keep the name, the Quad. So given my uh, limited time, let me just briefly move on to the Korea. It could be a great challenge for a country like Korea that are caught between the US and China. Korea's option and justification or rationale are bound to narrow when asked who it will side with, citing alliances and values, solidifying cooperation with existing allies. Trump's foreign policy has overlooked the importance of the alliance. And as Trump has also been at odds with European allies and allies by evaluating the alliance with money, there has been some breathing space between the US and China in Korea because we can criticize Trump as an individual. But in particular, regarding the alliance issue, it is likely that alliance issue between Korea and the US will be dealt with in order to restore the US alliance network, multilateral network. In this case, Korea's position of weighing between the US and China will be further narrowed. Yesterday, Chinese ambassador Xin Haiming in Korea invited some scholars in, in, the, in, a, in the places. And in his keynote speak, he's, he, emphasized South, he emphasized that South Korea and China should build up trust and set an example for a community of destiny. He also indirectly urged Seoul and Beijing not to participate in, participate in the Washington-led anti-Chinese alliance, saying that we two countries should respect each other's core interest. Given the Biden administration is expected to join forces with its allies in checking China, Moon Jae-in administration's strategic response is more important and difficult. Second, about Korea, China, uh, sorry, Korea, Japan, or trilateral cooperation or coordination of Korea, uh, Japan, and the US. In his presidential debate with Trump, Biden strongly criticized Trump for neglecting the de de deterioration of Korea, Japan relations in recent years. Improving Korea, Japan relations has emerged as a big homework ahead of the Biden time. As Biden values Korea-US-Japan cooperation, there is a situation where Korea-Japan relations cannot be put at their worst. He will seek to revitalize and promote the trilateral coordination in terms of a counter China strategy and guaranteed Pacific security. However, the gap between the two countries over the issue of forced labor during the Japanese colonial period and that the way we uh, solve that issue in the process seems to be so wide that it is and so politicized so that it is not easy to restore the bilateral relations. Lastly, let me talk about Biden's North Korean policy. First of all, it is not Biden's priority issue in my opinion. Considering the North Korean nuclear issue and by the Korea-US alliance issue, like uh, sharing defense costs and wartime operation control. Major US media outlets have pointed to South Korea as one of the most affected country in the US presidential election outcomes. However, 
For Biden, I think it is expected to put more priority on solving Middle East problems than on North Korea and take active measures. For the United States, the Israeli-Palestine negotiations and the restoration of the Iran nuclear agreement are the issues that can cooperate with European unions, I'm sorry, European countries. But for North Korea, there is currently no clear like-minded countries other than Japan that can unite. Second, Moon Jae-in, <coughs> excuse me, is gonna be having uh, his fifth year, that means the last year of his term next year. So Moon Jae-in and Biden's term mismatch can also be a problem. It is highly likely that the Biden administration will spend the first half of the next year to recruit new personnel and review the overall foreign policy of the former Trump administration. On the other hand, in the final year of the Moon Jae-in's term, the President Moon's diplomatic timetable with the US could be quite out of line because the Moon is rushing to make some achievements in the North Korean nuclear issue and inter-Korean relations. Thirdly, President Moon says Biden should inherit the achievements of Trump's North Korean policy. When the Foreign Minister Kang kyung visited Washington last year, she emphasized that issue as well. That is a US-North Korean summit. President Trump made a show off move toward North Korea, claiming that Kim Jong-un is smart and uh, they are in love affair, or he knows it because he met him. So, but Biden's emphasis on the importance of the alliance and practical denuclearization of North Korea contrast with the Trump administration because he criticizing Trump for granting legitimacy to thugs like Kim Jong-un and said there would be no summit unless North Korea showed clear denuclearization thus action uh, at the working level. Fourthly, human rights. I think a Biden value human rights so human right in North Korea is expected to serve as another variable in US-North Korean relation in the Biden era. So Biden is, is expected to pay more attention to that while Trump did not uh, pay attention to that or uh, did not appoint a special envoy for human rights in North Korea. But if the Biden administration actively raised the issue of this, uh, the country's human right, then the Kim Jong-un may take it as an attempt to interfere in uh, internal or sovereign affairs and overthrow its regime and strongly oppose it. Very lastly, prospect for how to deal with North Korea's nuclear challenges. In the early 2000s, Kim Dae-jung, then president and president-elect Biden became friends and used to support the engagement policy toward North Korea to take into account the early stage of North Korea's nuclear program. In this regard, there are two contrasting views among Korean experts or decision makers. The first, South Korean government emphasized the fact that Biden supported Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy. Therefore, he will continue for engaging policy toward North Korea and the redemption of US-North Korean negotiation. They say they are currently the, the ruling parties said U.S. administration has set the North Korean issue as a key agenda item. The role of the South Korean government is also considered to be strategically meaningful, and that Seoul puts Washington and Pyongyang at the forefront of the peace process. It is in line with the public consensus that the North Korean issue should be resolved in a peaceful way. In that process, the Korea will be the, like a, uh, the convenient, I'm sorry, like a platform or mediator, if not facilitator itself. On the other hand, Biden's position turned, uh, the, some argue that Biden's position turned to a critical stance as North Korea continued its nuclear test despite international sanctions. In a discussion with the Trump on October sometime, the Biden criticized the US North Korean summit, calling it, what has he done? He's targeted North Korea. And on the Korean Peninsula, he stressed the importance of nuclear free zone, which means that the North denuclearization that has been pushed back by the summer, the, show, the summit show uh, with the North uh, and uh, with between North and US or Trump and Kim Jong Un since the 2018 PyeongChang Olympics is back at the center. Therefore, if the current Minjin government puts priority on the peace process on the Korean Peninsula, 
over the complete denuclearization of North Korea, it is worrisome that policy gap with the US will widen. However, there are kind of a third point was just show up. One thing to pay attention to regarding the US discussion on North Korean policy is that both Trump's top-down approach and Obama's strategic patience both have not been enough to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue. As a matter of fact, both failed. In this situation, it is necessary to pay attention to know to the fact that some Democratic Party members are discussing the disarmament for denuclearization talks that lift some of the sanctions in line with North freezing of its nuclear and missile capabilities and proceed with the North denuclearization step by step. A bit surprised to learn that the Dr. Victor Cha, who was known as a hawkish approach to North Korea, said two, year, two days ago, a bold political strategist saying, US must deal with North Korea as, as it is rather than as it would wish, wish to be. And he was emphasizing uh, like political uh, negotiation because neither strategic patience with sanction nor summit diplomacy didn't work. So that he said, instead of the CBID, a mini deal might be an option. Um, uh, of course, the ultimate goal is the CBID. And for that, he said, in order not to go back to the what we started, he think of US North Korea political relationship is very important. Of course, he didn't uh, forget to say US North Korean uh, relation could be normalized with the declaration of peace, human rights dialogue, and security guarantees, and North Korea's declaration, declaration that it will not transfer nuclear weapons and materials and technology. But it's still a bit surprising saying US, uh, some of the Korean experts was emphasizing uh, nuclear a reduction, a nuclear reduction or arms control rather than negotiation of the denuclearizations. Because uh, in that, very much, Professor Lee, I'm, I finish, I'm finishing. It is more likely accepting North Korea's long standing insistence on negotiation of nuclear disarmament with the US than the denuclearization. So, between that, with, with, uh, in that process, I am cons I'm afraid of so called Korea passing. Uh, they just uh, ignore the, the Korea's presence in those negotiations. Sorry to taking a long time. An incredible, insightful review of the important implications for foreign policy. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Wu. Thank you. Uh, good morning from uh, Shanghai. Um, uh, I want to, to um, congratulate on the American people for your choice. Um, if uh, Donald Trump's um, America First principle has not make uh, has not made America great again, uh, this election result could make America great again. Um, this semester, I teach a class of uh, um, PhD students at Fudan University on U.S. Asia Pacific policy. So before the U.S. election, I did a survey in my class among thirty um, PhD students. 11, uh, uh, 11 of them thought uh, Trump could win and 19 uh, 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 for Biden. So it's kind of like 40 to 60%. So when the students asked for my opinion, I said uh, Biden uh, has a chance of 60, 70% to win. So uh, it seems I'm, I'm more uh, optimistic uh, than my uh, students about the US uh, politics. Um, it's interesting, uh, actually, in China, I think the elite are divided. They were divided over the uh, uh, US election. For those uh, who wanted to say a quick decline of US hegemony, they would welcome Trump's uh, uh, victory in the election. Would, would like to see him uh, uh, to be in power for another uh, four years. And indeed, in the last four years, no other people uh, uh, could have done a better job than Trump in undermining the US uh, credibility, reputation, and also destroying the uh, institutions that have served to promote the US leadership uh, in the last uh, uh, several decades. But for those who wanted to say an improvement of China-US relations, 
they would like to see Biden uh, to win. So basically in China, the elite uh, was divided. Uh, for the general public, I think they were more uh, uniformed uh, because uh, I think most of them, if not 100%, they just disliked Trump. They thought of this um, is er erratic, irresponsible, uh, lacking the quality both professional and ethical as a leader of a major power. And in terms of his personality, people just believe he's a mean person. Uh, I'm very impressed by my conversation with some taxi driver in Shanghai several times. They just show their contempt uh, for this person. So um, uh, and anyway, that this was the um, um, expectation before uh, the election. Now, uh, what what what's the reaction after the election? First, I think most people in China are happy, uh, glad to see. Uh, Biden win the election, uh, not only because uh, there is a good chance to improve China-U.S. relations, but more importantly, uh, multilateralism, international system will be repaired and preserved. And in, um, in a time when the international politics has been um, undermined by the uh, both of class nationalism and populism, uh, we may uh, uh, be able to introduce more stability and cooperation to international relations. So this is why people generally feel uh, happy with the election result. But also people, uh, including myself, felt shocked uh, at you know, uh, the fact that actually uh, Trump got more votes than Obama did in 2008. He got over uh, 70 million votes. So such an unqualified and actually um, uh, losing leader would receive such a high degree of support, which reflects the deeper invasion, deeper uh, division in the US society. So people were very, really, uh, uh, were really shocked. And they think this kind of fact we are continue to influence the US um, society and the politics and its foreign policy for a long time to come. Uh, that's something we call uh, a Trumpism without Trump. Uh, third, uh, people didn't feel surprised uh, at Trump's uh, refusing so far to accept the election result. Given his personality, uh, this is very natural for him to believe uh, behave like that way, but uh, generally we think uh, his attitude uh, will not change the election result. So even if President Xi from China has not yet officially congratulated on Biden for his victory, I think the uh, foreign ministry has already sent its uh, message to the US side. We just want to wait for the official occasion uh, to congratulate, congratulate on President-elect uh, Biden. Now, the third question, how this may uh, affect China-US relations? Uh, I think in some aspects, the difference between Biden and Trump in their China policy uh, will be in style rather than in substance. So uh, for Trump in the last four years, his China policy has been both uh, uh, unpredictable and irrational. So we hope um, Biden with a foreign policy team, very experienced, uh, sophisticated, they will be more predictable and more rational in dealing with China. One example is the uh, trade war with China, the tariff war with China, which uh, has been unpre unprecedented in human history. But actually this, this trade war, uh, although it hurt China, it also hurt the US a lot. Actually, it, it, it might hurt the US uh, more than it hurts China. So that is a, a, a typical irrational approach uh, to China policy. The second um, difference will be um, the Biden administration will be more able to manage uh, difference and uh, uh, um, manage the uh, uh, and reduce uh, uh, conflict and avoid 
and reduce conflict with China, which is very important. Um, we are the two militaries will continue to stand uh, up against each, each other in the Western Pacific, to be sure. But the question is whether we can behave in a mature way, uh, like uh, what the US and Soviet Union did in the Cold War, that we compete, but we didn't come into direct uh, confrontation and conflict. We believe the Biden administration should be more uh, capable uh, to do that. The third uh, expectation is that uh, the Biden administration will not break through the bottom line on issues like Taiwan or in political relations with China. On Taiwan, I think the Trump administration has been trying to uh, return to the 1950s US policy that's one China, one Taiwan. So that's try, that was a, a total subversion of the US Taiwan policy since uh, Nixon's visit to China in 1972, and which has huge risk for conflict in the Taiwan Strait, uh, not only uh, between the two sides of Taiwan Strait, but also involving the US and even its allies, uh, uh, such as Japan in this case. In political relations in the last several months, people like uh, Secretary Pompeo has launched a kind of campaign uh, uh, um, for regime change in China, targeting on the uh, China's political system, the ruling party and the leader himself. This has been very uh, uh, rare in the past. Even in the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, regime change was not part of the game. But in the last six months, we obviously saw people like Pompeo and uh, Pottinger, they have been driven uh, this kind of political warfare against China. And we hope uh, Biden uh, will change his tactic. Yes, as some of the uh, previous uh, presenters um, alluded to, Biden would pay uh, more attention to humanize democracy, this kind of value issues uh, in relation with China than Trump did. But I think his approach will be more issue specific rather than you know systemic. He will sit down with China to talk about US concern over Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, these issues. But I don't think he will really target on China's political system, the ruling party and the political uh, leader. Finally, last but not least, I think one expectation is that uh, the possibility of China-US cooperation uh, in multilateral settings, uh, how to repair and preserve the multilateral system that has uh, supported the current international order for many decades, how China and the US uh, and could cooperate with others to provide necessary public goods, especially in climate change, public health, under terrorism and many other areas. So uh, when people think about Biden's policy, uh, it's very natural they think about this in the bilateral settings, bilateral relations. But I think we should go beyond that. We should really have a genuine concern about China-US cooperation in a multilateral settings. Uh, China-US cooperation cannot solve all the problems we are confronted with. But if there's no uh, substantive cooperation between two countries, all the major issues we are confronted today cannot be uh, uh, resolved. And if we look at the example, uh, either climate change or the pandemic, they do not recognize national borders. They do not recognize whether you are allies or not. They are, you know, they, they are everywhere. They're global challenge, they're cross border. So that requires the cooperation uh, beyond uh, 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 the traditional allies and beyond the uh, uh, regional architecture. It really requires a, a global uh, effort. Um, the next point is that we also recognize the limit of the, uh, of the Biden administration uh, in its foreign policy, including um, in uh, uh, relation with China. First and foremost, Biden will be uh, preoccupied with domestic challenges, uh, dealing with the pandemic, economic recovery, and also uh, mitigating racial tension, uh, all these kind of things. 
we are uh, uh, occupy uh, a big chunk of his uh, um, agenda in the first year. And also he will face strong restraint from the Republicans, including uh, uh, Trump himself. Uh, Trump uh, will continue to exercise as a major obstacle to Biden's um, presidency. So how much uh, he can do in both uh, domestic and foreign front is a big question under the current situation. The third factor is that compared with four years ago or 10 years ago, I think we have seen a decline of US role in terms of both capability and uh, willingness. Uh, if you look uh, at the shifting power balance among the major countries, if you look at the public opinion in the United States, this is not a time that the US public favors strong international participation and even intervention. So I think the US will continue to play a major role in international affairs, but it's not going to be like in the Obama Euro, not to say in the Clinton Euro. This is a, a, a fundamental shift we have to be confronted with in the international politics. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call it the Americanization world, but certainly the expectation on the US from the other part of the world has dramatically declined over the last four years uh, under Trump. So Biden may help regain some uh, confidence, but uh, he has his limit. Um, I think in, at the end of the day, the most important challenge for the US is really not the foreign policy, but uh, domestic issues. I think the US is facing a very severe uh, situation uh, in several decades, if, uh, uh, especially since the end of Cold War. Politically, it's so deeply divided and antagonistic. Uh, socially, the racial tension is so high and systemic you cannot expect Biden will have a magic power, magic power to solve this problem. It's just impossible. And economically, this inequality is still growing. So this is why uh, like people like um, Senator Sanders has been so popular American, uh, among the young people in the United States. So if the United States cannot solve this political, economic and social challenges, and I'm afraid that Trump uh, presidency is not an episode. Maybe Biden presidency is an episode. So think about four years from now, there is a big uncertainty about uh, where the US will go uh, 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 um, in its domestic politics. And which of course also has a lot of implications for its foreign policy. So with that, I stop here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much for excellent remarks. Now we can turn it over to Professor Vogel to pull it all together and offer your own perspective. And please unmute okay. yourself so we can hear your comments, Ezra. Okay, can you hear me? You can hear me now? Um, I'm not sure how much I can pull everything together. But first of all, I want to compliment uh, our US-Japan uh, program under the leadership of Christina Davis, uh, a new professor, a former student, an excellent uh, scholar uh, who's taking the leadership and organizing these, and Shun, Biji, uh, Shun Fujihira, who is one of the great organizers and disciplined people in making an organization work. I think the US-Japan program it's really a great program and we have a great staff with Amy, Emma, Sophie and so forth. Uh, so I'm so pleased that they're taking this initiative. Uh, as you know, in uh, Shakespeare, there's a saying, sweet are the uses of adversity. And uh, I think the fact that we have turned the coronavirus era into a time when we can have close intellectual conversations like this uh, with uh, Korea and China and Japan uh, is really a wonderful uh, thing. Um, let me, uh, first of all, I must say, it, it's, I see in the faces uh, several old friends, um, Hugh Patrick, uh, 
uh, whom I've known for some 60 years, and Margot Gill I worked with here, Terry McDougall, uh, Ed Baker that I worked with in Korean issues here at Harvard over many decades, and such a pleasure to see uh, old friends who are so committed uh, to our uh, programs. Uh, and I think the speeches we've heard today in a way is a testimony to the fact that the, there is benefit to the United States in having such a good program of welcoming fine foreign scholars. Uh, because uh, when Nakayama-san and uh, Professor Lee and, and uh, Wishin Bok have spent much time in the United States, really a very good and subtle understanding of the United States, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly and the beautiful. And uh, I think that uh, is very helpful in trying to deal with the real problems when we have such good understanding, such good presentation. Let me say just a word about Japan and, and um, Korea, and then I'll say a little bit more about uh, China since that's the big issue. Uh, about Japan, <clears throat> I would uh, say that Japan now has, an, in a way, a bigger role to play than it's had before. And that I think it's gotten through the factional era and to now to have a more central policy and Abe build up the uh, central power uh, and I think that now we have a young, younger generation of um, people uh, like um, uh, as uh, people like uh, Motegi, who is the foreign minister, uh, and uh, also Taro, uh, uh, Kono, Kono Taro, uh, and, uh, and so I think that uh, with these young people. Uh, we have a potential of Japan playing a much bigger role. And I think dealing with China, they have been more re realistic the last few years. Uh, they have had difficulties and tensions, but they have remained polite. They haven't uh, gone into uh, crazy things. They have, their companies have found ways to have, build bigger and stronger bases of fuller understanding. Uh, their tensions, they're over the Senkaku Diao uh, area, uh, there are great tensions. Japan, I think, will remain firm with the United States and security because of the threats of China, but it'll, of course, find ways to work with China. So I, I think, in, in a way, uh, Japan has a, a leadership role to play that's bigger than it has before, and I think that's all too good. It's unfortunate they had Japan-Korea relations are so bad, and Korea has such a difficult uh, role to play now, but trying to get better relations with Japan um, I think it's not just up to Biden's problem. I think it's it's something that the Indians and Japanese have to do a lot of work on too. Uh, and of course, uh, China looking uh, standing nearby uh, <clears throat> and seeing that the Korean has difficulty in the Western alliance. Uh, if it worries about a Western uh, security alliance that might uh, cause problems, uh, the divisions are not the uh, worst thing in the world. Uh, but uh, I think that this uh, creates uh, great issues for uh, Korea uh, in uh, working out a new relationship with the surrounding areas. Now, um, in terms of uh, the Trump administration, I think it, it's you know, uh, Hugh Patrick and I uh, go back to the days of Roosevelt. The first uh, election I remember was between Woodrow Wilk, uh, between uh, Wendell Wilkie. Uh, and Roosevelt, and even the opposition, Linda Wilkie, wanted to have one world. He wanted to cooperate in the world. And I've seen the United States over quite a few decades, somebody who's past 90, and uh, this is by far the worst we've ever been. I think there are three, I would say, fundamental reasons why we got in such a mess. Uh, one is the social reasons. I think we have not made the transition from industrial society to service society very well. Uh, we've gotten much more unequal. We haven't provided this kind of security and, and employment that Japan uh, supplies its employees. Uh, we haven't uh, developed the national health programs. Our tradition of uh, individualism has been used by private corporations to look after their uh, interests and not to er erect a national system that's really beneficial for the health and uh, safety uh, of the whole population. Uh, and uh, so then I think the, in addition to that, that the progress that we've made in the recent years in the, uh, as becoming an international country 
and uh, of uh, letting the blacks rise to uh, more uh, the role that they should have been playing for a long time. That's great strains in a society that have been very quiet. I think Trump has capitalized on the underlying protests against our internationalism uh, and uh, the rise of the, the blacks and other minorities. Uh, so I think those are underlying social things. And then I think the fact that the new technical development of the media, which has allowed uh, a very different situation when Hugh and I were growing up and we had uh, one or two uh, TV stations that we listened to uh, and uh, newspapers that everybody read. Uh, and now the communication means you, you listen to somebody who has the same prejudice as you do. And so that's led to a much more divided population. You get very, uh, when I talk to my friends, I, we can't, I can't believe that they accept the things that Trump does. And my wife says, you know, they listen to some other kind of news. Uh, they don't listen to the same news that uh, we Harvard people listen to. So I think that has been an awful thing. And then we have this combination between this strange person, Trump, uh, who is selfish and principled and yet has great talent for getting media attention uh, and uh, selling newspapers and uh, uh, selling print. So I think those things have made America in a much more difficult situation than ever before. So what I think <clears throat> uh, Biden, of course, will face terrible diff difficult problems. Uh, uh, the decline of America last year, the fact that we pulled out of uh, <clears throat> a climate uh, program, we uh, pulled out of uh, Fulbright and uh, in uh, China, and we pull, pulled out, uh, a, a, a closed the Houston consulate and uh, we closed Voice of America. You know, we, we closed down so many things. And, and uh, so uh, that is such a terrible thing. We have lost, uh, in a way, the confidence of our allies that we can be relied upon. And that's not something that uh, a new president can get back quickly. Uh, once, once having lost the confidence, can they depend on the United States? Well, like even if Biden does good things, uh, he cannot be considered so reliable. So I think that's a, a, a new worry. And then, of course, the divided country doesn't have a full political support. But what he, he does have two things. Two. I think one is that he's, he's a decent uh, American who wants to pull our country together and is respected as, as one who is decent and stands for American values that a lot of people are ready to support. The other is, is as Shinbaum mentioned, uh, he has a lot of good staff uh, who worked with him for many years. And so they can move right away. Uh, I think even if Trump doesn't uh, give him the secret information uh, from the government, he'll have ways of finding out a lot. And he has very experienced and uh, uh, Trump has been able to rely on, he's gotten rid of a lot of the most knowledgeable, able uh, technocrats and uh, Biden will have those technocrats. So I think he has uh, a lot he can do. Now in terms of what we can do with China, I think that uh, with China, uh, we have a very uh, nasty relationship now. It's a challenge, uh, they're competitive, uh, and yet uh, it, it's gonna be so easy for some people to say, well, they don't have human rights, look what they've done to the Uyghurs in the Hong Kong, uh, or a different kind of communist society uh, to make it a clash of civilizations. Uh, even more than Sam Huntington was talking about. I think a lot of people like to see it that way. And I think the challenge is uh, to try to work with China in such a way. We have to, I mean, China has problems domestic too. It, it has trouble gaining unity in the leadership field. They have to crack down in order not to fall apart as the Soviet Union fall apart. And uh, to, that means that they've been tougher on dissent and other points of view. Uh, and that makes it difficult for intellectuals. So there, there are problems in China. And uh, so we have to find some way, and I hope uh, people like Shinba and those of us uh, on our side uh, who, un who understand these issues better uh, can help supply support for our two countries uh, to begin uh, to have serious, quiet talks and to build up gradually uh, some uh, confidence. Um, I've probably gone on too long, but it, it's, it's my way of saying that 
I think the issues that we've been wrestling with this evening are so important and we're lucky to have such able people working with them. And I wish you luck in continuing these dialogues. Thanks, Shin and, and uh, Christina. Thank you very much. I think you've offered us an important perspective on the problems in the United States society and maybe there is hope going forward. If more people can follow your own example of being open to learn from other societies, it may be that American democracy needs to start looking at others and ways to build social unity when there are differences of opinion. How can you come together and build uh, common values, whether it is going back to the foundations of school and local community, conversations and dialogues, we need to think of a way for America to reach beyond all of the polarization. Listen to shared voices, like you say, the common media that used to be one shared um, communication. And we need to all think of how we can do this. At the same time, it is interesting that where the US used to dominate international politics, we see a special opportunity now where as there was a less leadership from the United States, Japan went forward and concluded trade agreements. While the US has been absorbed in its own election this week, Japan, Korea, China, Southeast Asia concluded a major trade agreement. And so instead of countries worrying that the US will bypass them. I think the US needs to worry that the world will bypass us if we cannot come up with a new vision. And I think that the conversations today have shown many of the areas we all share common concerns and let's hope we can continue to have these conversations and um, we'll see the directions that lie ahead with the new administration. Thank you so much for joining. I'm sorry we didn't have time for questions, but I think we all can agree that we've had excellent presentations from our panelists, Professor Nakayama, Professor Lee, Professor Wu. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And Professor Vogel, as always, you are the leader of our program. <laughs> okay. Thank you all and good night, good morning, enjoy the day. <laughs>